Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for the invitation for joining you this uh, morning. I think it's very appropriate that I will speak after the scientists, because somehow politics will have to follow science. <coughs> to me, that sounds like a very fundamental, very elementary thing, that, of course, politics will have to be inspired from what we know, will be based on the science. But somehow that provokes some resistance when we are talking about climate change. It's, it's strange because being a politician, I mean, if it's about health policies, it's about how to, to do things with cancer, or if it's about evolution theories, yes, there might be some scientists who would question that, but it doesn't sort of make us just doubt too much on how we are basically going to, to run our societies, what is important and what is not. So I really think that it is sort of unfortunate that we still have too much discussion around this science, science, science. Not that we should discuss science. Of course we should. Of course there should be other opinions heard. But it should not sort of slow down the decisions that we have to take. So that is why I, uh, from the position I have now, I'm looking forward very much to the next IPCC report next year. Because I remember very well, I was a Danish minister at that time when we had the force assessment report and how that actually stimulated the discussion and focused the discussion. And I think that we need to have sort of reinstalled that kind of urgency, that sense of urgency. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the report. Of course, it would be wonderful if the report next year would tell us that we could just relax and just continue business as usual, but I somehow get the feeling that that is not going to be the message. I'm not a scientist myself, but I think that it's sort of striking that what science has warned us, that is actually also what we see unfold around us. And there seem to be more and more sort of that fits into the pattern and I hope that that will convince more and more people that we should really be serious about this. Each year brings a catalog of extreme weather events and new records, many new records around the world. Uh, this year, to mention just a few, we've had the biggest drought in the United States for over half a century. Flooding and landslides in northern India and in the Philippines, severe floodings across Pakistan and in parts of Britain last month, and the smallest area of Arctic sea ice ever recorded, just to mention a few, just from very recent months. To list extreme events in this way risks making them sound rather banal. But behind many of these events lie human tragedy and high, very high economic costs also. People killed or injured, families broken up, homes swept away, livelihoods uh, livelihoods wrecked. I recognize, of course, that most scientists say that it's difficult to establish whether a particular event is actually linked to climate change. It's very difficult to establish that until years later. That is in the nature of natural signs. But the overall pattern of events seems already to be bearing out the forecast that climate change will bring more frequent and more severe extreme, extreme weather. And that is why, of course, it makes a lot of sense to focus on the risks and the costs that we are willing to take on, also by continuing just business. As usual, I'll come back to that point. And the statistics seem to, to bear out this conclusion. The average global temperature has been higher than the 20th century average for no fewer than now 330 months running. I think that that is something that is just worth noting. For 330 consecutive months, we have had higher average temperatures than in the 20th century. And yet, despite the warnings from IPCC and the relentless evidence of climate impact since then, climate action is still being hindered, it's still being slowed down, it's still being questioned in some countries by small, but I must also say sometimes quite powerful skeptics, or by those who have a vested interest in continuing business as usual. Don't forget that. Uh, I see that at, at my desk. There are so many things going on, and I would argue with what we heard in the beginning, that as, as if there is less going on now than six years ago. No, there is more going on. Uh, 
in the cities, in the municipalities, in the companies, in the boardrooms. A lot of things are going on and that is positive. But it's also clear that in order to carry the bulk, we really need politics because there is still too many who have a very, very huge interest in not changing anything. What do we do with this? Well, it's obviously difficult because perhaps it's also a question of the human nature that we somehow want to ignore good advice sometimes. Want to postpone, it's easier just to do what we used to do. Uh, just another, uh, an example from another world, but all, after all the health risks of smoking are well established, yet a sizable minority of the population still smokes. The same with obesity. The difference is, of course, that with climate change, the risks are not just personal, they are global. But I see some changes uh, coming, also on the scientific part. I'll come back to Europe in just a moment, but I think that it's quite encouraging that in the United States, it seems that despite all the challenging of the science, I saw as late as last week, there was a poll saying that 75% of Americans in a very big poll now said that they actually thought that there was something about climate change and there was a man-made component there. Uh, we also have probably all heard about this Professor Richard Muller, who used to be a skeptic. He was financed by some very, very rich skeptics and those who had some vested interest in, in oil and, and what have we. And then he said, now he really wanted to dig deep into this and then present why it was basically a hoax, but he found the opposite. And he came out and said, now I'm convinced there really is such a thing like climate change going on. For our part, the European Union base our climate policy on what the science tells us needs to be done. So that is also why we have been fighting for this two degrees threshold for many years by now. And we see it as quite a substantial progress that first in Copenhagen and then cashed in by everybody in Cancun uh, two years ago. It was actually possible now to get the two degrees threshold as something that the whole world can unite around. Now I know that um, now when it's tangible, then some people start to say, maybe we should just forget about that two degrees. I think, how is it when we have economic goals? We have a lot of economic goals for the time being. It's extremely difficult to achieve them. But it does not mean that then suddenly we say, oh, can we just sort of change the goals? No, it means that the focus is on how can we make more effort. And of course, it must be the same when we are talking about climate change. Also, we already have many of the technologies. It's a question of developing them further and making them mainstream. It's about energy efficiency, renewable energy, green electricity, carbon capture and storage, smart grids, hybrid and electric cars, passive houses, smart buildings, things we already have there today. And that is also where I see some kind of change from only a few years ago. Actually, it's no coincidence that last year, worldwide, we had the largest takeoff of renewables ever. Even in Europe, despite of the crisis, we had the largest takeoff of renewables. I tend to believe that that is linked to our binding targets uh, for that. But it's just to say that also out there in the field, action is happening. Last year, we in the European Commission published our roadmap to a low carbon economy which sets out a blueprint for making this transition most cost efficiently. Building a low carbon economy is a necessity. It is not a luxury. But it is also an opportunity to boost economic growth and create jobs in Europe and around the world. We really believe that this can help us getting out of the crisis. But it takes one thing. It takes that we stop first addressing the economic crisis and then after that, the social crisis and the job crisis. And then on some fantastic day where we don't have anything else to do, then we will start to sort of deal with climate. We have to think these three crises sort of coherently together. And I was actually very encouraged last week in the commission when we had a discussion on what should be our recommendations for all the member states for the next, what we call the annual growth survey. We always call it something that nobody can understand. Uh, but it's about sort of what should be the priorities when the member states create their next budget. And it was a very, very clear sort of uh, 
decision now that we will, in that work, incorporate climate, the green economy, the resource efficiency into that fundamental economic narrative so that the three crises can be looked at together. This is important for climate and for resource efficiency, but it's also important because of the macroeconomics. Because uh, if you take Europe's macroeconomics, last year we paid 315 billion euros just for imported oil. Our combined trade deficit, EU27, was 150 billion euros. In other words, it's more than way down uh, what all other sectors sort of create of surpluses. So if we sort of could reduce that bill, it would not only increase our energy independency, but it would actually also improve our macroeconomics. And I think that now for many years, uh, also due to the Stern report and others sort of giving input here, we know that we also have a price to pay if we continue business as usual. I believe this is one of the more fundamental changes of the way we think, the way finance ministers think, the way economic, uh, economists think, that we have to sort of understand that continue business as usual, that also comes with a price tag. Actually, according to the Stern Review and many others, the price tag for continuing business as usual is higher than if we actually started to do something about it now. I also think that we saw, saw it in Professor Stocker's uh, presentation. But that is the kind of thinking we need. And we believe that in order to make the transition take up to, to scale now, we really need targets. Uh, we need pricing. That's some of the key instruments we have used in the European Union. But I would add one more thing. I think that it's extremely important now to move on with this going beyond GDP. And I know that to some that sounds like, oh, that sounds very theoretical. Can that change anything? Yes, I think that the moment we actually start to put a price on other things or a value on other things than just sort of materialistic growth, then we sort of get it to the core of our economies. Then when no matter what kind of decision politicians will have to take, then suddenly uh, also the cost for climate, the cost for environment, the cost for nature, the co cost of natural capital, when that starts to be factored in, in the calculations before you have to cho choose between A or B, that will change things more fundamentally. I believe that we in the European Union has made abundantly clear that we want the future global regime to be ambitious, comprehensive, and legally binding. Uh, it must also be based firmly on the latest science, and that means that one of the key discussions coming up, and I know you're going into details with this to la today later, so I'm not going to, to dwell too much on that, but it's just we also need to address the ambition gap this side of 2020 when the new regime has to enter into force. But we should also recognize that there are some key issues in the negotiations where science while having a role to play, cannot provide one-size-fits-all solutions. I'm, of course, thinking particularly of the principles of equity and of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Both these principles are enshrined in the UN Climate Convention, and both will be politically challenging to apply in a rapidly evolving context. Europe stands fully by these principles. But we believe that they need to be interpreted dynamically so that they can take account of the world as it is today and not as it was back in 1992. The firewall drawn up 20 years ago, which divides the world into developed countries, which must take action to reduce emissions, and developing countries, which are not required to do so, is no longer fit for purpose. It's not a small thing, it's a key thing if we are to stay below the two degrees uh, in, these, uh, and in, in, in the year, years to come. Today, China is by far the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitter, and India, Brazil, and Indonesia are all in the top 10. The developed countries must continue to take the lead in cutting emissions, obviously, but we need all big emitters to contribute like we agreed in Durban last year.
What Europe believes is needed is a climate regime built on a spectrum of commitments that are fair and consistent with the evolving responsibilities and capabilities of different parties, which will continue to change over time. And these commitments will, of course, need to deliver on the agreed global warming targets. Just a final point on that. I know that some say, should we then wait for this international deal uh, top, top down, and then we just sit back waiting? And others will say, no, let's give that up, and let's just have it bottom up. But I believe that it's a false dichotomy. Of course, we have to do both. We have to have sort of the top-down overall framework, but of course we also have the solutions to come up from the bottom up. I believe, uh, and I will end just the last two minutes on uh, the, the, the threats and the security implications, just very briefly on that, that. It's very clear that climate change has the potential of being a threat multiplier. I know that your next session will address this, but I would like to touch just on some of the concrete threats. There will be threats in the Arctic. There will be threats with migration and clashes as sort of following that. But I would just like to stress one uh, threat in particular, and, and that is that of food security. In the past four years, we have already seen two big global jumps in food prices in which extreme weather has played a part. The sharp increase in 2008 caused food riots in more than 20 countries. And the second, that last year, is considered by some to have contributed to the Arab Spring. On top of the worst regional drought in 60 years, the price rises are seen as having played a part in the terrible famine in East Africa in which tens of thousands of people may have died. This year, droughts and heat waves have damaged crops in the United States, India, and several other countries, pushing up some grain prices sharply this summer. As climate change becomes more severe, these supply, supply problems will get worse. And at the same time, we are living in a world where still more people will ask for still more food. According to the UN, by only 2030, we will have a demand globally increase for food of 50%. I mean, that's the kind of equation that we have to sort of make fit in the end. Uh, so I just think that's one example that illustrates the very, very big challenge here, namely the challenge were to think much more across the board when we discuss these kind of issues. And I think that's also where the discussion on climate has evolved since six years back. Now, it's not just an issue for environment ministers or climate and energy ministers. It has broadened out now. But our big challenge is, if we're talking about security, that's for foreign ministers. Maybe it's also for defense ministers. Normally, it's not so much for developing ministers or climate ministers or finance ministers. But the challenges of our century, they will run much more across the way we have structured our administrations, our governments, our portfolios, whether be it in politics or in business. And I think that is one very, very big challenge to all of us. How do we better organize ourselves in order to be capable of solving all these cross-cutting issues. Uh, I think that also very much goes for the security angle, because that means that it cannot just be left with foreign ministers or, or diplomats. It has to sort of be another way of cooperating on these kind of, of issues. Uh, on. So I think I will uh, just leave it there. 15 minutes is not a lot, a lot of time. I think you asked me around 12 questions in the papers I saw. But uh, I'm looking forward also very much to see the report of this meeting because I can see that you will have a lot of good input before the end of the day. And it would be really good for us in Brussels to know all the things that you're coming up with today. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you.